Hello, my love. Hello, darling. Because this week we watched Season 6, Episode 3, The Pledge Drive. What the hell was that about? There was this. This was a weird episode. Yeah, there was uh, a lot of things that didn't go anywhere. Uh, did you like it? Not really. No. <laughs> uh, the pleasure drive was written by Tom Gamel and Max Prost. Ugh, those guys. Yeah, I. I mean, they they wrote some some bad episodes. They wrote some problematic episodes. I went in and looked at all of the episodes that they wrote. Mm-hmm trying to think of the one that I will like the best. And I think it will be season seven's The Wink. Okay. Yeah, you were talking about that the other day. I was talking. I didn't realize that was a it was a it was a gamble and prost joint. <laughs> Anyways, I, I think that'll probably be uh be the one. Maybe when we've watched all of their episodes, which I think they have four more. My microphone was slowly rising away from my face. <laughs> it's like a slowly rising helium balloon. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm good now. Um, I think they have four more. So when that's over, maybe we should go back and... Rank the... Rank the... Gamble and Probes. Yeah. The Pledge of Tribe was directed by Andy Ackerman. It aired on October 6th, 1994. Vulture.com. No. Ranked it as the 29th best Seinfeld episode. Get out. Uh, They said, uh, Uncle Leo trying unsuccessfully to stop the pledge drive uh, was exactly something they did. And uh, eating candy bars with a knife and fork and how quickly it spread was Mm. classic absurdism. Okay. That Seinfeld is known for. I I wrote... Uncle Leo at the end trying to stop the pledge drive is one of the reasons I didn't like this episode. Uh, I mean, what's going on at PBS? Anybody, anybody's just allowed to walk <laughs> yeah, backstage. Exactly. Uh, like, oh, I'm going to watch you tape the thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess they probably, with all of the, the volunteers, there's like, you're, they're going to lose track of people, but you figure that like. Are you a volunteer? No. Get out of here. Yeah. Uh, Screen Crush ranked it as a uh, much more appropriate 120th. Agreed. Uh, saying that the George following the driver that cut him off goes nowhere. Much like George in the car. Yeah. With Tanny Tartable. Um, But they did give it a thumbs up for a couple that talk too much alike. And uh, Mr. Putt eating a candy bar. With you know what? Like, the, the, the high talker was funny. And I feel like it was um, wasted in this episode. I feel like bit. that was wasted. I feel like... Uh, so do do you want to talk about that now, or do you want to get to the part where we talk about the episode? (laughs) Well, let's talk about it right now. So apparently they had like, so one thing that, you know, I listened to the previous episode. Yeah. I, I start like 12 sentences. (laughs) Don't get through any of them. (laughs) And here you are criticizing yeah. a story for going nowhere. I feel like uh, Nana getting going down to the bank in the alley and talking like that guy approaches yeah. her uh, and like, you know, you, you get a little reverse, like you think he's going to, you know, be mean or like yeah, mugger yeah. or something. And he's very helpful. I feel like they need to like either elongate that, but apparently they filmed like, seven scenes of like Nana's day in the city oh my God. where she was on like a violent subway. She talks to like a postal worker to get directions. And apparently there was so much of it that they didn't even include it on the DVD extras because the technology at the time didn't have enough like video footage <laughs> storage for this. So why though? Like Jerry's Nana, a very cute old lady. Yes. I felt like... Do you know what else she was in? Why don't you tell us? No, you don't, because we haven't done the guest stars yet. Go. 
So the Pledge Drive guest starred, uh, had returning guest stars of Len Lesler playing Uncle Leo and Ian Ambercrombie playing Mr. Pitt. Mm-hmm. However, we also had uh, Billy Ree Wallace playing the role of Nana. Oh, okay. She was in ER, Mad About You, and a movie called Glam, where her character was named Bobo. <laughs> We had Kelly Cofield play Kelly Cofield Park, now Park, at the time she was Kelly Cofield. Oh, well. Playing Noreen. It's like a bad name, isn't it? Have you ever met anybody in your life named Noreen? Sorry to all the Noreens listening out there. Anyways, she was in In Living Color. Oh. She was also in Jerry Maguire and Scary Movie. Mm. Brian Reddy played the role of Dan, the titular high talker. Mm hmm. He was in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, Madam Secretary, and Outbreak. His face and name sounded familiar, so hmm. I, I couldn't have told you that he was in those things, but yeah, he looked familiar. And then we had Rebecca Stab playing the role of Kristen. Stab? S-T-A-A-B. Oh. How, how would you pronounce that? Stab. Rebecca Stab playing the role of Kristen. She was in Port Charles. Live Shot, and Guiding Light. Is poor Charles a soap opera? <laughs> Couldn't tell you. She was in a hundred episodes of it. I think it's a soap. What are we supposed to do now? You're supposed to read the recap or the no, synopsis? No, I'm supposed to throw it back to last week when I asked you if you remembered this episode. Yep. Everybody's eating candy bars with a knife and fork. I was on the street yesterday. I saw a guy eating M&Ms with a spoon. Did you? Yep. I remembered the candy. So Jerry volunteers for a PBS pledge drive. A high talker confounds Elaine. Jerry cashes old checks from his Nana. Mr. Pitt eats a candy bar, strangely. You didn't mention George not liking when people fingered him. I'm surprised Netflix didn't mention that. You know, I think the idea of each of these stories is good. But, like, having all three of them together, maybe... Mm. Like, what's good about a, from an episode that has a bunch of storylines is that somebody has to have nothing to do mm. and just be the observer. And it's usually Jerry. Mm. But Jerry's got a story now. Mm-hmm. And there's too much other stuff going on. Like, George only shows up halfway through this one. Nah. Does he? I think we can agree that it's messy. Sure. I wanted to mention last week, and maybe it was in the first episode as well, but the Seinfeld logo at the beginning is like teal and aquamarine. Mm-hmm. It's very aggressively 90s. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're in 1994, right? Yeah. Jerry in his stand-up compares buying a greeting card to hiring a prostitute. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm not a big fan of greeting cards. <laughs> Mainly mm-hmm. for many of the reasons that Jerry says. Like, and I don't think he influenced me into this. I think I've come to it through my own uh, experience. So why don't you um, make your own greeting cards and write your own sentiment in them? If you, if buying one is so offensive, I don't want to do anything. <laughs> do you think that greeting cards in general are dumb? Like if you buy a gift, do you just you just don't put a card on it? I would prefer that. Yeah. Well, like for for holidays. Mm-hmm. Right? You put the sticker to from. Yep. Like, the sentiment is, here's a gift, Merry Christmas, Mm -hmm. whatever. I guess, why isn't it the same for birthdays? Well, I think you get to an age where it's a little bit silly to get, like, birthday gifts. Sure, but then you get into card territory, because you and everyone you know are older, and- I don't don't want a card. I just, just, I I barely (laughs) want people to say happy birthday to me. There's always those four people- who take the time to send a birthday card to everyone every year. And I like it. But then it, you you run into exactly Jerry's problem. How long do you keep it? Like, I, wrote, do, I wrote this down. Do you how, have to display it? How long do you keep a card? I don't, I don't, if I had my druthers, I would throw it out immediately. Mm, like the one I made you for our anniversary? I kept that. You You kept it where I put it? On I didn't throw it out. <laughs> so it's just still where I left it uh-huh. two weeks ago. No, it's uh, prominently displayed oh, in, sure. uh, on our uh, teak uh, hutch. <laughs> Look at us, the teak hutch. 
be a good uh, drag queen name. T. Kutch. Everybody, put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, T. Kutch. <laughs> Why did Kramer say hello, my love? Why did Elaine say hello, darling? And, and then, then it just, just went nowhere. Weird. Jerry's got two lemonades in the fridge. Yeah. Like two two liter cartons of lemonade. And I also noticed a new magnet on his fridge. Oh. Uh-huh. A sun kissed raisins box oh. magnet. There you go. There was some other crap on there too. I couldn't really see. Do you remember the like sun kissed raisins phenomenon? The the California raisins. Yes. They had their own cartoon. Yes. Like, were they trying to get kids to eat the brand cereal and they were just like, yeah, I'll put some raisins in it and make a cartoon and kids will want to eat brand flakes. I think they were just trying to sell raisins. I don't think it was brand flakes. Oh, I thought it was like no, I think they were co branding at- with raisin bran. Oh, uh, we'll have to fact check that. Because I think it was just to advertise raisins. And it was like a kind of a gross character. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I can't get over the hello, my love. Well, maybe Kramer was just joking. But there's no joking about the financial crisis at PBS. <laughs> I don't have anything to say about the, the telethon. I have no notes on this episode. And I don't mean like it was a good episode. I have yeah. no notes. I, I found this episode did not have anything worth writing down no. and noting. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve things written down. I fin I filled out the page, but that that was in my fact finding after the episode ended. Kramer goes, I was promised tote bags, and tote bags I shall have. I'm not leaving the premises until I get my tote bag. Nowadays you can't go anywhere without getting a tote bag. We're drowning mm. in tote bags. A gift not enjoyed is like a flower that doesn't blossom. So how come you never read any books I buy you? Well, I, when was the last time I read a whole book? <laughs> I've decided not to buy you any more books. I buy you Comedians Getting Cars and Coffee, the book. I've I've read parts of it. You glanced at it. It's a coffee table book. I know, but I've I've bought you books, our whole relationship, and I don't think you've read a single one. And I've chosen those with more care than you would choose a greeting card. Mm. I bought you things that I thought you would like, that you would enjoy, and you've not even cracked the spine. I've probably cracked the spine. Mm. Maybe instead of like going out and getting something corporate, you could like... Make something yourself. <laughs> I shall write you a book of poetry. Mm-hmm. The Cherry Clan candy is gone from near the cash mm-hmm. register. Yeah. You're like, we brought it back. We thought it was going to be big. It was not. There was a uh, there was a rack of candy There was, bars. but there was no Cherry Clan. I really don't like the term candy bars. Did I, we talked about this, didn't we? No, we didn't. But candy bar doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. It's a chocolate bar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is this like a soda pop thing? Yeah, a little bit. How do you eat it? With your hands? Great line. So something of note, hmm? uh, Ian Abercrombie, apparently um, in the scene where he first started eating the Snickers bar with a knife and fork, he couldn't chew fast enough. Hmm. Um, so he was told to just swallow the pieces whole. Oh my God. <laughs> and over the course of filming the scene, he apparently ate Four Snickers bars. Well, I did notice that the pieces kept reappearing on his plate. And at one point, he's just like tapping the plate with his knife and fork. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like pantomiming <laughs> that he uh, was eating something. Why couldn't he just put it in his mouth when the camera's not on him, spit it out? I think he was talking while he was doing it. I don't maybe? know. I don't know. Poor man. Apparently, the day after it aired, he was eating lunch in a restaurant and the waiter brought him a Snickers bar on a plate. <laughs> Do you remember going to get that? Deep fried Mars bar and how it was not good. I think that's one of the things where it sounds like it's going to be much better than it actually is. Yeah. That we ate with a knife and fork. Yeah, that makes sense. You have to. The waitress is constantly giving George the finger. See, like, they don't, they don't, they don't finish that up. Like, why was she mad? Nope. Was she mad? Yep. If she comes back, is she going to be mad again? How, how does Danny Tartable sit in the car with George and get driven all the way out of town and not be like, you have to turn around. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Take me back to Manhattan. <laughs> like, he got on the turnpike. Is that in New Jersey? I don't know. I don't know. Like, about an hour ago. Yeah. Outside Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. 
So I looked up Chemical Bank. Yeah. They existed from 1824 to 1996. Oh, big sad. Not big sad. They acquired a whole bunch of other banks. Oh. Including Chase, and then decided to change their name to Chase. Oh. So they still exist, kind of. They're like the third biggest bank in the world. No, oh, it would have been so sad if a bank failed. <laughs> I wrote down, okay, Elaine is a bad person. Mm. This is it. This is the episode. You're finally on board with that? Yeah. What uh, What tip the scales? Her yelling at Nana. She's a mistake. Look, I know that she's primed by this guy calling and leaving messages constantly. Mm-hmm. But she can't tell the difference between a 90 plus year old woman mm. and a man with a high voice. So I don't know if you picked up on this, but they ADR'd his voice to be higher. No, I didn't pick up on that. Really? Was it Noreen? Doing it wasn't. Voice? They they hired another actress to oh. just do the voiceover. That's so silly. She was right there. <laughs> I wonder if they thought about having her do it. And uh, they were like, oh, no, it would be too. Mm. They could have had her do the lines and just pitched it up a little bit or down a little bit. Anyway. So one thing I, I saw in the background of PBS was a poster called Millennium. Mm. Remember when everything was Millennium? Everything was 2000. Yeah. Silver. Everything was silver for the millennium. Anyway, this was a poster for a miniseries. The tagline is Tribal Wisdom in the Modern World. Mm. It's 10 episodes celebrating the life ways and worldviews of small scale non technological societies. Were they getting ready for when computers died and we were going to have to like go back <laughs> to that time? Like, learn now how to survive. Uh, it won a Primetime Emmy and four Gemini Awards because it was a uh, Telefilm and Rogers collaboration. And there was a lot of CanCon in it. Mm. Um, one episode highlighted the Oka crisis. Oh, yeah. And then another one mentioned a Canadian abortion counselor. I'm not sure why. I was just skimming the synopses. Okie dokie. That doesn't really seem like. The life ways and worldviews of a small scale non technological society. No, no, it doesn't. Yeah, and and it just had a weird ending, like Uncle Leo getting on camera and like, mm-hmm. like pleading for them to stop the pledge drive, and then Elaine and Jerry just seeing everyone eating candy bars with cutlery, and she goes, "What's wrong with you people?" And then it just ends. No tag. Yeah, it's weird. So I read an article called Why Are Greeting Cards So Expensive mm. by The Atlantic. The last greeting card I bought, was it $10? Yes. It was $10. And it didn't sing. It didn't have like pop-up it was, stuff. It was it was a it piece was of cardboard with card. some writing on the inside. Yeah. I was shocked. So the the premise of the article is that card companies have learned that if they're simpler cards, the ones without doodads are more expensive you're more likely to buy the even more expensive doodad card Mm, yeah okay so if like a plain cardboard nothing is 7.99 and one that sings is like 9.99 you're like well might as well just yeah sure whereas if it was a dollar yeah i think if you went to like a hallmark store or like a actual gift shop they're cheaper but like i feel like those don't even exist anymore shoppers uh yeah Thanks, Galen Weston. Now we're from our sponsor. <laughs> we are sponsored by... Loblaws. Do you want expensive bread? Each brand is exactly the same price, surprisingly. We have to pay the government $50 million because we're overcharging you for bread. We'll still keep doing it. Inflation is hard because our profits are high. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Go to no frills. Guess what? We own that too, sucker. Did you know Loblaws owns TNT? I think we looked that up recently. Mm. It used to be independent. They bought it, what, like... I don't know. I was going to say 10 years ago, but in my head, I'm like, in like 1996, like 10 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Well, on that note... The only other uh, note that I wrote was, he's bald. I know that's a guy thing. Well, that's something. He belches a lot. (laughs) 
it is kind of interesting, like that Noreen didn't notice that he was a high talker. And then the second that somebody points it out, she's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> and Elaine has to bring up his manly qualities of being bald and gassy <laughs> to mm-hmm. convince her that he's okay. That's exactly what you want in a man. <laughs> well, what's on for next week? I don't know. I thought it's your job. I didn't look it up. Uh, the Chinese woman. Uh-huh. Chinese woman? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Donna Chang? What's it about? It's about a woman who is not Chinese. Oh, plot twist. <laughs> I have corrections. Give them to me. We were talking about the OJ Bronco chase. Uh-huh. It was about 90 minutes long. Oh, okay. So, but it the whole day was he was supposed to turn himself in uh-huh. at 11 a.m. At 2 p.m. he hadn't showed up and he was declared a fugitive. They traced his phone because he was using it. And then the chase ended around 8 p.m. So it did kind of. It's like a whole day thing, but yeah. like the actual. So that was in June and that episode aired in September. Mm. So still very fresh. Yeah. Um. So I went back and watched the scene in Newman's apartment again. There are some more things we missed there. A gumball machine, a pineapple on the wall to hold mail, a Super Nintendo, the game Trouble, a doctor's office scale, like with the the height thingy and the Mm. the things you slide, a regular penguin. We saw the blue penguin, but there's a regular penguin elsewhere. A fan clipped to the back of the sofa. You got to stay cool. (laughs) Another fan across the room. A vase, say really cool. <laughs> a vase full of fake cherries. An inflatable devil pitchfork. A cat food dish. And a thigh master in the box. Okie dokie. How do you know it was in the box? It wasn't just a box? Well, it may have been an empty box. It was a thigh master box on the shelf. Hmm. I don't know what was in it. A little presumptuous. What do I have? 3D vision? I think I was looking up kicks. Oh, yeah, because kicks versus corn pops versus crispix versus corn bran. I did like a deep dive on cereal and uh, a website um, talks about the unhealthiest cereals in America. Mm-hmm. The worst cereal is Honey Smacks. Okie dokie. I don't think they sell that in Canada. That's the so. bear is. Uh... No, that's Honeycomb. Honey Smacks has a frog on it. Yeah, and they look like puffed oatmeal. Yeah, they look like they should be healthy, but they are really not. Mm. Um, but this, I don't, I don't trust this site because it said that Rice Krispies cereal was a spinoff of Rice Krispies treats. Who wrote this website? And also, don't they have like Cookie Crisp, which is just chocolate chip cookies <laughs> and milk? Yeah, that's it for this episode. All right, let's call it. Bye. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, my love. Believe it or not, this is our podcast. Please subscribe at the end. If you subscribed, we would be happy. Please subscribe to us. Believe it or not, it's our podcast. Is that a Seinfeld reference?